Good afternoon and welcome to the New Farmer Project webinar series. And I'd like to welcome folks to our session today, which is about selling to regional markets and working with wholesale markets. Our speaker today is Annie Rowell, who works with the Vermont Food Venture Center at the Center for Agricultural Economy in Hardwick, Vermont. And I'd like to thank Annie for joining us. And uh, I'll encourage people th to um, any questions to please enter into the chat room so that we can address them as we go through the presentation. At the end of the session and in the chat room now, you'll see a link for a survey. Um, we'd love to have your feedback on this presentation, so please take some time to respond to that and give us some feedback about this. And uh, I guess with no further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Annie to talk to us about selling to regional markets in Vermont. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, great to be here. I'm looking forward to, to talking with you all. Um, so the name of this presentation is New, New Opportunities in Wholesale Markets. And um, we will talk first about some, some big picture themes in Vermont regarding, regarding wholesale markets. And then I'll talk specifically about, um, about the work we do here at the Center for an Agricultural Economy and how that plays into the, to the bigger conversation. Um, there are, um, the, in 2014, the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets um, conducted a survey of Vermont farms about their engagement in, in, or, and or interest in wholesale markets. Um, so some of the initial findings of that survey show that 57% of respondents want to expand direct sales to institutions, restaurants, and retailers in the next two years. 35% of respondents have developed and implemented a formal food safety plan. And as a result of selling to institutional and wholesale markets, at least 39% of respondents made infrastructure improvements, such as purchasing equipment or constructing new on-farm facilities. So these are some of the dynamics um, of what farms in Vermont um, have done or um, or are interested in, in doing for pursuing um, some of these some of these different types of markets. Um, in, in, the, in considering selling to wholesale markets, um, some of the typical um, challenges and, and benefits in selling in selling wholesale are um, you know are a big part of the of of that um, calculation um, when looking at your, your farm business. Um, and some of the challenges can also be, be the benefits. So, um, so those are, um, some of them are um, replicated in this list too. But, um, but some of the challenges are maintaining profit, profitability in markets with, lower, um, with potentially lower margins or prices. Um, various requirements for each market um, can vary and can also be pretty um, pretty precise. So from food safety to liability um, and, and the time spent building a relationship with the buyer, um, which can be very fruitful but can take, um, can take extra time. Typically, there's a need for consistency and high volume. As that's listed here as a challenge, it could be a challenge for some farms. That could also be a huge benefit to other farms. So it's also um, listed under benefits. Um, there can be a different level of communication um, where it's, um, and, and that can vary for, for any type of market that a farm is selling to. But, um, but you, you know, talking with, with different buyers, it may not be the, the store owner, um, as in if you're selling directly to, um, to retail, it could be um, a lot of different folks that, that are involved in the conversation. Um, some of the benefits concerned to wholesale that they can be um, dependable and uh, Annie, we seem to have lost your audio.
resume recording. Okay, let's take it from there. Great, thanks, Heidi. Um, the so the model that I'll be talking about today specifically um, is the wholesale model of selling to a food processor, where um, where the raw crop um, gets gets processed and then resold into um, into institutional um, or retail markets. So the typical um, the typical model, um, and it, it relies on um, high volume, low to mid price point um, in relation to other markets. Um, the relationship um, between the farm and the food processor can either can be dir a direct relationship. Um, it could happen through a distributor where the food processor is sourcing through a distributor or sourcing through a food hub. Um, and there are likely um, product specifications that um, that are fairly specific. The 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 specs may vary from a typical um, from what other markets would would call a grade A or a number two. Um, for example, the a number one spec may be bigger than a number one spec for retail for carrots, for instance. Um, and the number one spec for the food processor may be more accepting of some some things like um, um, surface blemishes or or a, you know a crack in the carrot than a, than a retail um, market would be for a number one product. So those are some some pieces that come into the into this overall model and the relationship. Um, so I'll go um, I'll tell you a bit more about what. Um, our organization does um, on the whole and then get back into the specific program. Um, the Center for an Agricultural Economy focuses on serving three, um, three groups. Um, the food businesses, our community, and, and farmers. So the services that we provide specifically for farms, um, one is the Vermont Farm Fund which is a revolving loan fund that focuses on growing the local ag economy and offers low interest, no hassle loans to Vermont farmers and food producers. Um, the second service is, a far is our farm and food business advising where we provide technical assistance for farms and food businesses and this is done um, in partnership through the Vermont Farm and Forest Viability Program. And our third program is the Vermont Food Venture Center, where um, which is a 15,000 square foot facility that has three processing kitchens um, and is used by food specialty food businesses um, and and also um, other other food producers, um, where farms can can use the building to create value added specialty products. Um, we provide recipe development and nutritional labeling services. Um, and then the piece that I'll be talking um, to you about today is um, is our work where of selling crops, um, or where we process uh, vegetables for um, for a social enterprise where we are um, where we purchase crops wholesale from farms. Um, in the over um, the first couple of years, we've been open since 2011. Uh, we are focusing on developing our internal processes, um, in accumulating equipment, and focusing on becoming a really good processor. Um, so one of our big things, our big focuses was how can we use this building to serve, um, to serve farms and, and meet the need of creating, creating new markets. Um, so the three questions that guided our work were, what grows well here, what can we process well here, and what types of cuts and or frozen products are in high demand among institutions. So working from a mix of data-driven and anecdotal evidence, we selected four different crops to assess their viability as fresh cut or frozen products among Vermont institutions, and we started with schools. Um, so we looked at four crops and we um, gathered information on 23 different cuts of those crops in which involved both fresh cut and a frozen form. Um, so these, this is some of the initial data that we gathered from schools and this was in an attempt to, to, defi to define the market opportunity um, for, for this type of a product um, as in order to kind of to create this wholesale market. 
So these, uh, this is the resulting data. These numbers are in pounds. And um, you'll see, you know, for carrot sticks, for instance, are the highest product on this list in demand among schools. And that's largely due to um, the fact that many Vermont schools receive funding through the Fresh Fruit and Veggie Program, which is a separate budget and allows schools to purchase products like carrot sticks. So that was, that was very appealing to many schools. So from these findings, we, we um, used this data and some initial data from other institutional markets like colleges and hospitals um, to, and filtered it through this rubric to identify which product made the most sense for us to pursue. Um, you'll see that we have first tier and second tier products where we looked at is it, is it in high demand among, um, among the um, institutions and schools? Is it easy to make and is, it, there's, is there an ease of supply at a good price? Um, so these were, you'll see the top eight products are the, were the top rankings. And, um, and those were the products that we, that we pursued uh, to, to find more information about and really test through this, this model. So over the course of this year, um, we, in gathering more data, testing some products out through, through, through sales and regular production, we found that um, the, the initial market size that we found for schools was 49,500. That's results from 86 schools. There are 334 school districts and educational entities in Vermont. We anticipate that this market is big, to be bigger than indicated here. Um, market pricing for institutions, um, we, we put a number of $73,500. Um, it is based on more anecdotal evidence because we have not done extensive surveying um, of Vermont institutions beyond schools. So this number is based on expressed demand and some sales history for products among seven institutions. Potatoes are included in this number, uh, which is a weekly order from, from UVM. Um, there are different types of markets have different demand for uh, different variations of vegetable cuts. So for example, institutions like colleges and hospitals have high, or like colleges, have high demand for fry cut potatoes as you'll see in this, in this image here, uh, we expected 50,000 pounds, while schools have a higher demand for a wedge cut potato. So as we're thinking through which type of product um, to consider making, there's um, very different, um, that can um, have implications for uh, a different market being able to use it. So one, some of our, um, our initial um, findings on this is that school demand will not solely support the processor and food producer in this food system. Um, we are focusing on diversifying the marketing and sales focus among different types of markets in addition to schools um, which include other types of wholesale markets and looking further into retail. Um, our recommendations, um, as a result of that, our recommendations include um, more market sizing work with specific focus on institutions. Um, and which in, indicates that market diversity. And then further market research and testing for other crops and cuts of, of various crops. So which would include, um, we've been looking into cut and or peeled onions, sweet potatoes, uh, winter squash varieties, and, um, and with those considerations, it's always a, an equipment, a, a question of equipment of investments needed um, if we were to take on more of that processing. So for onions and squash, that would involve, um, that would also include an equipment consideration. So some of our main findings on the processing side is that we know um, we can process storage crops well uh, and typically into a diced, sliced, whole peeled, shredded, or fry cut form. Um, we know we can freeze broccoli well, uh, we can freeze blueberries um, very efficiently, and we're moderately efficient at processing carrot sticks, um, and that will take, as, as we um, continue to, to grow the market for that product, we will have to, um, that will become an equipment question down the road. Findings for, for producers. Um, 
and I'll talk more about about the specific work we did regarding um, um, creating resources and defining this market for producers in a moment. But the main um, the main findings were that there are two classifications of producers selling into this market. Um, the first being large, possibly conventional and specialized, and the second being small, um, mid, possibly mid-scale, or small to mid-scale, possibly diversified and organic. The demand from schools and a mixture of larger institutions like hospitals and colleges um, suggests that the biggest market opportunity for small to mid-scale producers lies in beets and carrots and the biggest market opportunity for large and conventional producers lies in potatoes and broccoli. We worked with um, the Intervale Center and the uh, Vermont Farm and Forest Viability Program to create resources for, uh, for farms in an attempt to, get to define how this market works um, to help farms plan to grow for this market. Um, so the, the different resources available um, include enterprise budget um, outlines, a sensitivity analysis, and finally a resource guide. Um, in the creation of, that, of those enterprise budgets, um, there is a, um, an outline, we create an outline of the assumptions um, built into, into creating those budgets. Um, so the cost of production um, enterprise budgets for vegetable crops was done using enter crop enterprise budgets developed by Richard Griswold in his book, The Organic Farmer's Business Handbook. Um, two production scenarios were used in creating that analysis. So these are the assumptions behind the enterprise budget. The first scenario is that um, being a low debt mature farm, um, the overhead is based on five acres of mi mixed vegetable production. Um, Purchase price of, of $250,000 um, with a $200,000 mortgage, some off-farm income, and um, a labor rate calculated at $14.22, which is a loaded rate for mixed crew of skilled manager and crew. Um, the second scenario is a new high-debt farm with a similar mortgage where the farm does not have off-farm income. Um, all overhead covered by the farm. Um, it also includes a 20% reduction in labor efficiency for all production related activities um, and is representative of a farm and startup phase. So the first farm being a low debt mature farm, the second scenario being um, a startup phase farm. Um, and those, so those crop enterprise budgets are um, our resources that we have available for farms that are interested in growing for this. Annie, are those available through the Center for Agricultural Economy? They will be, yes they will, and we will have them on our website. They're not currently available as we um, are, it, it's funded through a grant that we have yet to report on, but they will be available on our website. And um, I will say the, the um, resource we currently have available, that I'll be sure um, that Heidi um, has the um, the, you have the document, I believe um, you were able to put it on the New Farmer website for the resource guide? Yes. Okay. Um, that so would yeah, be so great. That's the, the main document that we will have available for folks and that will include a lot of the um, sort of the how this market works sort of questions. So the, um, yeah, thanks Eddie. The sensitivity analysis um, outlines the business model financials. So it starts from the raw product cost to, to production, to distribution, and to final price point to the end, end customer. So it's both a reporting tool as well as a prediction calculator. So we can anticipate how one changing variable could affect the entire model. So if we say, you know, oh, distribution is actually 22% through this distributor, and so it's going to affect um, the final price point by five points, or it's the the carrot from this farm is going to be five cents cheaper. So we can we can really track that um, those differences uh, in real time. 
Um, so we use that to make an informed decision on whether or not a new market opportunity can support what the producer, the processor, and distributor all need to support their viable business, businesses and organizations. Um, the resource guide is a document to define how this model works. And it's a tool, it's a tool for, for farms, again, that we do have available now. So through the, through the resource guide, um, it outlines the two main processes involved in, in selling to this market. The first being planning, which is the bulk of it, and the second being, being purchasing. Um, planning is um, mostly happens um, as as is, seems to be standard in Vermont um, between December and February. Um, in the crop planning process, we go through its three main documents. The Good Faith Growers Agreement is basically getting the handshake agreement on paper. It's, um, it's not, um, it's meant to be a, a very um, general agreement that has built-in exit strategies, but <coughs> can also be the summary document that, that covers price, crop specs, variety, quantity, the timing of harvest and delivery, and communication expectations. Um, so that's, that, that's the main, that's the heart of the planning process. The other pieces are um, evidence of a written food safety plan. We don't require GAP or any specific food safety um, you know, food safety plans, but just that there is evidence of one. We do provide a checklist that folks can use, but um, but it's meant to serve as, um, you know, in, in place of if, if there's currently not a written food safety plan. So we really um, are looking for, for evidence of that in a written form. Um, and then the third piece being a traceability checklist for produce farms. Um, and so that's, that's getting into, um, lot tracking and being able to identify um, the fields that product came from. So we also provide some, some documents in, in the appendix and um, recommendations for where, for where folks can go to look for more information about that. Um, and then the, um, in getting into the purchasing piece, um, typically our terms are, are net 30. Um, we do um, the delivery expectations are, are again listed in the good faith agreement. Um, in the appendix, we do offer um, some of the, the crop specs in a, in a summary form with some of the acceptable containers we can receive product in, um, which is nothing, um, it, which is all fairly standard um, from, from usable plastic containers to, to vented plastic bags to wax boxes. Um, to field bins, so we can be pretty flexible, and we we do see the delivery container as as a cost saving, um, as a potential cost saving for the farm. So we can it doesn't need to be packed um, in a in a beautiful way. Um, and then container labeling um, involves it goes back to the traceability checklist. So the it involves the farm name, product name, um, address, phone, and the tax date for for those. Um, for that crop. In, um, in order to communicate the story of, of farms and products to the end users, um, to the end users of these fresh cut and frozen products, um, both food service and the end consumer, so the, not necessarily the person purchasing the product. Um, in order to, to, to communicate that, we created a brand name um, and we we called it just cut, and these products are fresh in the fact that they were just cut in Hardwick. They're um, fair, that they're cultivating a viable new market opportunity for Vermont farms, and, um, and simple in the fact that that's all that's done to them. They're just cut. Um, and so we're, we're excited that, um, you know, that this can be that that direct way of, of telling, telling stories. We've developed um, different marketing materials to, um, with, with pictures and, and quotes and um, all farm names um, from the firms that we source from are listed on, on the materials um, in the form of posters or table tents or rack cards. Um, 
And, and just in a summary from what we've done in 2014 um, and where we're headed in this next year, um, we purchased 46,000 pounds of potatoes, carrots, beets, and broccoli from 14 Vermont farms um, and processed those crops for local institutions. Our goal for 2015 is 86,000 pounds of local crops made into fresh cut and frozen products. Well, thank you, Annie. That's all very exciting news, and the information that you've shared is, I think, going to be very helpful for farmers who are looking at the potential for the wholesale market in this region. And we really appreciate the work that you and the folks at the Center for Agricultural Economy, the Intervale, and with um, Farm and Forest Viability have put into this. Um, we would love to have feedback from folks who participate in this webinar, so please use the link here. To, uh, to copy down this link to go and give us that feedback and we'll look forward to hearing from you uh, uh, through this. Thank you very much and thanks Annie. Thanks so much Heidi, great to talk to you all.